Hi, I'm John Mitchell with Rep Fabric. I'm one of the founders of Rep Fabric, and we're here at Blue Box Studios today. Scott, why are we here? With- <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Scott Stock. I'm Chief Revenue Officer at Rep Fabric, and we are here, John, to talk about a variety of topics. Um, we'll be talking, doing a series of topics over several weeks. Some of them are going to be business-related, meaning CRM and what to look out for when implementing, how to cr- increase adoption, those kind of things. So not specific to Rep Fabric, okay? Other topics, though, are going to be really specific to Rep Fabric. And we'll warn you at the beginning which ones those are for yeah. sure. And actually, I think we look forward to uh, also interviewing some of our customers, maybe telling a few sales war stories that uh, yeah. they've had, that we've had, uh, and so on and so forth. Look forward to uh, having you guys along for the ride here. Awesome. Let's jump into a topic we started a little while ago. We talked about company IP, protecting that company IP. And we talked a lot about the company Rolodex and sure. the companies yeah. and contacts and getting all in one place, right? Yeah. But that's not the only company IP that salespeople have, right? There's other pieces of IP. You want to talk a little bit about what those things are? Yeah, absolutely. Well, really the contacts and companies that salespeople sell to. Yeah. That's really the baseline. Right? Okay. You got to start there because yeah. that's what says, Hey, I should go to this customer versus this customer and get orders. Who's, who has the right trends and so on and so forth. Yeah. But that information just by itself is its own IP. Mm. And what happens is, as you're iterating and you're knocking on doors and you're finding out, you know, the experiences as you go out and you turn over rocks as a salesperson, you're starting to gain IP about the personas you're selling to. Right. Right. You're also gaining IP about the specific companies and the efforts, how they work Mm -hmm. internally, who you need to talk to, so on and so forth. And that information really for many people is still stuck in their salespeople's heads. So it never can get actioned by all of the other, you know, members that are also aiding those people in selling that account, right? In that account. And so it really spans from everything, right? It spans from, Hey, understanding here's the person who could potentially buy my product. Yep. Here's the the buying signals that they have. Maybe they buy on a seasonal basis, maybe not. And capturing that kind of information so that you can be as effective of a seller as you possibly could be. So that's and, that's kind of like the that's kind of like the contact profile, right? You know, so yeah, what, yeah. What what contact groups do they belong to? What right. products do they have interest in? Right. And our, and who's the decision makers, right? Okay. And in yeah. sales, we always talk about, hey, do we get to the decision makers, right. and and do they have the authority? Do they have the, you know, is now the time for that to happen or not? Right. And do they have the budget? There's there's like three or four other check boxes, if you will, that right. as a seller, you know, it's okay if if you check no, you should be moving on to the next, so that's, on to the next. That's the profile of the contact, segment. but there's right. also the salesperson themselves who's calling on that contact. Are they able to document? what they've talked about with those contacts because they may want to share that with people on their inside team or with their manager or with their peer because they may have to transition that account at some point or they just need help on that account. Well, and and it works both ways too. So not only do the the outside salespeople need that, but a lot of times the inside salespeople, the quote people, the customer service people want to, you know, continue to build that profile of that customer and that contact because they're going to have interactions with it that may aid the outside salesperson who's going to help raise more money right? right. and uh, and ask for those orders. So if I'm, so, if I'm the outside yeah. person, right, and I'm walking yeah. into an account, I'm getting ready to walk in, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if Susie has been talking about their accounts payable. I wonder, I wonder if Tommy sent them that quote. I wonder if my right. inside guy has talked to their purchasing aid. I need to be able to look at that stuff on my phone. We, call, moment, that, we right? call that the fan blade, right? Because <laughs> right. you're walking in as a, in yeah. a, as a salesperson, are you yeah. going to walk into a fan blade as soon as you get in there? Yeah. Because that immediately puts you into that uh, beta position of selling, right? right. Like right. instead of the alpha position of you should buy my products and we're great and we're going to take care of you as a customer. All of a sudden you're on your, you're yeah. on your heels Why going you backwards. Why you back to me about this? Hey, yeah. where's that chip? Where's my product? Right? Yeah, yeah, where's my product? How come it's on allocation? Yeah. Um, why did you sell me this? You should be protecting my business, you know, as, as a, an important vendor to us. Yeah. Uh, and and so... And instead, you, you want to be alpha, right? You want to be able to go in and say, hey, John, you know, um, I know we haven't got that product to you yet. I know Tommy's working on it for you. Right. I know that Susie sent you a quote for that other thing you wanted. Because you've seen that, right? You're, you're reviewing that before you go into that account. 100%. Yeah. And, and if you're not selling from that alpha position, you're probably not going to have the victories that you want to have right. in, in those accounts. Right? Yeah, it's, it's proactive versus reactive, yeah. right? Yeah. And the very basic level. And, and it's amazing in a sense that 
as business has gotten so complex with so many transactions yeah. and, and, and so many companies do so much more with so much less, yeah. uh, it's difficult for people to stay on top of that. So without an overarching system to help them keep those things organized when they're going out. And, you know, when I, when I had my rep business, I think we were reporting on the neighborhood of about 400 individual distinct opportunities or sales cycles wow. on a given month, wow. right? In a given month. And so for... Across how and, many manufacturers? Uh, you know, probably 20 or so. Wow. And, and as part of that, we had an inside person, an outside person, and our job was to keep that funnel full of, uh, 400 different deals that we're working on mm -hmm. and staying on top of them. And they're all moving at different rates and they've all got different products behind them and, and, uh, different personalities of the buyers and the, and the designers and so on that go with that. And just staying on top of that big machine is difficult, right? And what's happened is in, in that same venue of more with less, People today have to have that full of a funnel unless you have one or two really big accounts that make your numbers all by yourself. In the case of a manufacturer's rep, it's great to have those big accounts, but you can't live on those accounts only right. because otherwise <clears throat> your manufacturers are just going to go direct at those big accounts. And and that's that, uh, right? You, and you then, use the D word yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, going direct. I know, which is always a, you know, what we... Challenge. Yeah, yeah. it's a challenge, right? And, um, you know, we're blessed in the sense that we serve industrial businesses that are multi-line selling that have line cards with associated cells that go with it, right? If in the electronic space you're selling processors, you're probably selling memory, right. right? If in the plumbing space you're selling showers, you're probably also selling faucets and sinks, right? right? And so throughout that, you know, throughout that cycle, the associated cell is what creates manufacturers reps ability to have deals that are moving with the same customers over and over and over again with and complimentary that, products and that customer might right. be mad at you on one line but right. they might be thrilled with you on another right and so that's the value you bring as a rep is that in a sense you're almost an extension of your customer's company and looking out for them because you know i know you were a manufacturer in in your your old days yeah and uh you know when you looked at the ip that you guys had and yeah. that you were collecting from your customers, your distributors, your end users, you know, uh, whatnot. I mean, how, how did you guys manage this IP aspect of, of what you did? Yeah. You I know? mean, look, it's the, the last company I worked for was in the U S you know, $1.3 billion. It was worldwide $18 billion. And I can tell you up until a few years ago, the answer to that would be not well, right? I mean, yeah. we really didn't do it well. Um, well because you're a manufacturing company. Because we're a manufacturing right? company, yeah. but yeah. we were also I mean, I was the head of sales, right? So we're right. also a selling company, I'd hope. Right. But we didn't do a good job of that, of protecting that company IP. And people left, so did that. And and it, it, I'm going to come back to another question because you said something about funnel. I'm going to come back to that for the manufacturer's viewpoint. But as far as company IP is concerned, we implemented a CRM system for our salespeople. Mm -hmm. And we implemented a CRM system because we needed to get more data in the funnel. And so and that's what I want to come back and talk yeah, about. Yeah, let, let's talk about, I mean, uh, you know, from a data perspective, mm -hmm. how could you make business decisions as a manufacturer in this data drought scenario? Right. right? What, what should you build? Should you build a million of these faucets? Right. A million of these tubs? What do you do? Yeah. So when I went into an SOIP meeting, right? So what does that stand for? SOIP is yeah. uh, sales operations and inventory planning, right? right? It's basically where the commercial team talks to the operations team, right? So right. going into that meeting and having an operations person ask me what's coming down the, down the pipeline. I'm going to go back and reference the funnel you talked about as a rep where you had 400 opportunities in your funnel, right? right? Well, as a manufacturer, if I don't have line of sight to that funnel, I can't predict what I need to make for that funnel to support that funnel. Which leads to allocations, not right. having the inventory. Correct. So that in a sense, like you as a rep, if your manufacturer can't fill that order, you're not going to get paid the commission on it either. Exactly. Right? So, so that there has, has to be a symbiotic relationship between the rep and the manufacturer, right? Right. And without some kind of communication, there's a data drought, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm living in a world yeah. as a manufacturer where I don't know what you're selling as a rep, right? Do you, do you have your MBA? You do, right? <laughs> Where do you think that comes from, that idea of data decision-making, yeah, right? data-based I mean, decision-making? Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's so, what they teach you in MBA schools, yeah, right? Yeah, is yeah. That you're going... Yeah, MBA school, sure. Yeah. yeah, just making sure that you've got that data so that you can but make I mean, a look, proper decision. We're, we're, yeah. we're both... I know you're a chemistry major, but we're both, <laughs> and I'm an engineering major, but we're both engineers, problem solvers by heart, and you right. can't solve problems without data. So right. 
as the as a head of sales and you got a, a rep team out there and they're selling stuff but you don't know what they're selling until you actually get an order you now you're not able to inform your business on how to run right, right. and that's yeah. what you just talked about how, yeah. how now you're not going to be able to satisfy your customers right so in our case what we did is said okay i'm going to put a crm system in because i need to have line sight these opportunities and oh by the way i need my reps to fill out my crm system so i can see what's going on out in the marketplace so it's not that i want to micromanage it's that I want to right. better inform my business with good data, right? right. So that's the right. idea of why your manufacturers are asking you for all this data. It's because they're trying to make their business run better. Do you think there's a difference between, let's say, data-driven manufacturers who are maybe publicly traded and, and giant versus those that are you know, more small, smaller mom-and-pop cottage industry type manufacturers? I think the, the larger guys have a bigger buffer meaning because there's so much out there that they're, they're providing, they can kind of have a better mix of inventory. I don't think, though, good data management is a matter of size, right? Mm -hmm. I think a small manufacturer with good systems and processes, I mean, one of the reasons why we created Manufabric is right. for this, right? True. Good systems and processes is so that they can really wrangle their data. So I don't think size actually gives you the... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the, the, like, the innate ability to manage yeah. data better, right? right? I do think just having people that are process driven mm -hmm. and on your team and really able to absorb data and, and communicate to the organizations is super important. Mm -hmm.